Good morning. morning. So I want you to imagine that you live in a world where gods are regional. And what I mean by that is you in your city and on this mountain, you have a god that supposedly is all powerful over that region. And then when you cross geographical borders, you go into areas where there are gods that are controlling that area. And as you go throughout life and you're navigating living in these different areas, the claim is if you're going to live in this land and you're going to be with this people or you're going to be prospered in this area, you need to worship this God or that God. That was the land that the Israelites walked into when they walked into the promised land. All the people who lived in that region had their own gods that they believed were all powerful in the areas that they were over. So if you were going to try to come against me and attack me, my God was going to defend his territory. So when armies would go out and fight, it was actually almost like a competition between the gods of who was really more powerful. Think about if you lived in a land where you were surrounded by a culture that worshipped the god of the river and the god of the harvest and the god of uh, the valley and the god of the mountain and the god of the sky and the god of the sun. That's the land that the Israelites lived in when they were in slavery in Egypt. There was Ra, the sun god, and there's the god of the Nile, and there's the god of all these things. Imagine how influential that would be. That you're in this land and you're in these places where all of these other people are trying to get you to worship these different gods. And that the way that you're supposed to worship these gods is by bringing them sacrifices, offerings, whatever it is to try to please those gods so that they will bless you and give you favor. And so, you do these things. You serve these gods, mostly out of fear of what they could do to you and out of a desire for the gifts that they may give you. This is the environment that the Old Testament it starts to be written and recorded in as God, God of the universe, God who made all things, starts to reveal who He is, the one and only true God of all creation, showing the world who He actually is. Over and above all the other gods that these other religions and peoples worshipped, And he calls the people to himself. You are going to worship me and me alone. Now, this is not a claim that would be extraordinary. There are plenty of other gods that would have demanded that they were the ones only to be worshipped. But this God starts to show his people who he is and then starts to show them through things like the ten plagues as he breaks all of these areas and shows that he has mastery over all of these areas that they claim their gods did, as he blotted out the sun, as he turned uh, the Nile into blood, as he did all of these things and showed that he was the one who controlled all areas of their life, that there wasn't multiple gods ruling and reigning in Egypt. There was one as he leads his people into the promised land and they taunt him and challenge him and different empires and kingdoms say, you know, you may want to fight in that territory where your God is, but don't come challenge us over here. And as he continually leads his people forth into battle and shows that there is no geographical border that limits his power, God's intent, God's purpose in the Old Testament, and what he revealed about himself was to set him apart as there is no other that even comes close to comparing to who he is. One God over all things. And the Jewish people were the stakeholders, the the people entrusted with this particular revelation of who God is. That there is one God and no other. 
He alone is worthy of worship. He alone created all things. It is only by Him that we are to be saved. And you get that claim. The thing that they can look back in the Old Testament and see how many times their ancestors abandoned that and worshipped other gods, and God brought death, persecution, judgment on them for it. They were the people tasked with upholding this truth that there is one God and one God only. And when they failed, it had dire consequences for them as a nation. Now imagine you are standing in Jerusalem and a man named Yeshua of Nazareth walks up to you and says he is God to be honored and worshipped as God. There is a heaviness, a weight that comes with that claim. What would instantly be in their minds are all the generations of their ancestors who had suffered because they abandoned and compromised the truth that there is one God alone to be worshipped. So last week when we read where Jesus starts to make the claim that he is equal with God, they rightly responded by beginning to seek to kill him. Because the claim he was making, if it is not true, could destroy the people again. They needed to guard and protect themselves. And so, Jesus, making the claim he does, over the next several weeks as we study 28 verses where Jesus just speaks this monologue he gives us about who he is in relationship to the Father, what we first need to really delve into before we hit that monologue is we need to be good people who believe in one God and one God alone. There's a reason why God revealed himself as one for those thousands of years before his son showed up and so showed that there is some complexity within that one. And so if you see the two uh, props I have up here, this is something that is based off of, and we're going to talk through this, something called uh, the Trinity Shield, or the Shield of the Trinity. It's an old helpful tool that was used to talk about how do we understand God being three in one. The first and most important part that we're really going to delve into this morning is the center part, God. So that when we're talking about this, and as we're understanding the claim that Jesus is really making over time, what we never want to do is start to try to think that there is somehow multiple gods. There's one God. One God over all things, over all peoples, over all cultures, over everything in this world, there is one God. And so, we are going to be good stewards and students of the Old Testament this morning and build a foundation for some of the claims that Jesus is going to make. In the Old Testament, there was God, who is often referred to as Father. And so, we're going to talk about that this morning. God in the Old Testament, how he revealed himself, who he showed himself to be. And it's going to help us when we get to Jesus' monologue to understand some of the claims he is making about himself. But what I want you to listen to is as we go through this list of attributes or characteristics of God this morning that he showed us in the Old Testament, I want you to be thinking about things that we have already studied in John whether it's passages or certain claims that are made, where you can start to see that the line between God and the Son is starting to be drawn to help us understand and try to come to grasp with who is this God really. So, as we begin, I want to give you a story because there were some good students of Scripture, that when this kind of uh, test was being put to them, when they had a messenger named Paul showing up on their doorstep telling them about 
Jesus, the Son of God, they had a metric, a standard that they used to determine whether or not this new revelation about Jesus was genuine or not. In Acts 17, we read, As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. So we have this group of believers of Jewish people who are good stewards and good students of God's Word, so that everything we're going to talk about this morning, about one God and one God alone, they would have embraced. And when Jesus started making the claims he did, their beliefs about who God had already shown himself to be was going to help them, guide them into true knowledge truer understanding so that they do truly believe. Because just because someone makes a claim about God says X does not mean we should believe them. I'll give you the biggest one that gets thrown around so often and carries little weight to me. God told me. When someone says to me, God told me, blank. I, because it is used so carelessly now, usually God told them to do what they wanted to do. It's usually how that's used. They had a stirring, an emotional feeling that this is what I should be doing, and may even go against counsel and wise people who are speaking into their lives saying otherwise. But there's a standard that we can use to help us discern through when God really speaks to his people, and that is what he has already spoken. He never contradicts himself. I have had a young lady tell me God told me it was okay to divorce my husband. And I could clearly say, he did not tell you it was okay. Something else told you, not him. Why? Because God has revealed things that have been true and tested. And so, whenever we have something that is new that we are learning, or some new claim about God, or someone saying, God told me blank, my go-to response is to see if Scripture in any way contradicts what that is. But if Scripture upholds it, if I can find precedent in Scripture for it, I will be more likely to believe it. So, like the Bereans... Let's look at all the things that are kind of revealed about God in the Old Testament. Not all of them. That would take a really long time. A lot of the things that build the case for whether or not to either accept Jesus and his claims or to deny them. Okay? The first is God is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They do not worship multiple gods. They worship him alone. Exodus 20, where the commandments are given, you shall worship no other God. It's clearly stated. It is only for him that we give our full allegiance and love and devotion. The second thing is God is creator. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 44, verse 24 this is what the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, says. I am the Lord who made everything, who stretched out the heavens by myself, who alone spread out the earth. He's the one who gave order and purpose to all of his creation. It was not designed with him forgetting certain things about it or not planning ahead. It wasn't a matter of trial and error for God where he's creating something and then having to come up with plan B later on. He designed this world for a purpose, an end, an intention, and then he created it and set it in motion. This world is his creation. 
This world comes from him. And as such, another thing is God is the source of life. Genesis 2, 7 says, And then the Lord formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. Psalm 36, 9 says, For the wellspring of life is with you. Does that language sound familiar? Okay, I heard a yes. We're going to test it. Where does it sound familiar from? The Samaritan woman. For the wellspring of life is with you. By means of your light, we see light. God is the source of life. He's the one who gives life, who enables it to exist, who sustains it. It comes from him. Why? Because he is himself life and life abundantly. He's the one who gives us our life for us to go and move and have our being. He's the one who sustains us so that we may go around in this world living, breathing. If he at any moment ceased to desire that the world keep living, it would disappear in an instant. He's the source of life. The third thing is God is all good. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, and His faithful love endures forever, His faithfulness through all generations. Psalm 135.3, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to His name, for it is delightful. Psalm 145 verse 9 says, The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all He has made. Now, I remember one time sitting in a restaurant having a conversation with our waiter. And I asked her, what do you think you need to do to like, be with God, to know him, to get to heaven, have a relationship with him? And she said, oh, well, I think you just need to be good. Which is a very easy, simple answer. And it's something that's very common. But let me ask you this. The standard of good, that's a comparative word. Like, if I say this is good sweet tea that I'm drinking, I'm saying it's good compared to bad sweet tea I've had in the past. There's some standard I'm holding it up against where I say it is good compared to this. It's not a, good is not something that just in the wind has no meaning, where you just kind of in the moment have a a sense of, I really think this is good. Good is something where it comes from experience, from seeing it compared to something that is better than it and that's worse than it. But something that is good, it's always being held up in light of something else. When we talk about God is good, what we are not talking about with him is him being held up and compared to a standard. We are saying he is the standard. He is the standard of what it means to be good. He's the one who is good and not evil, meaning that he wants to bring prosperity and abundance and life to his creation. It is out of his overflow of, like verse 40, or Psalm 145 said, the Lord is good to everyone. It is in his nature to be good and compassionate, even to those who are against him. Because he is good. His wrists are not restrained. He's not being forced to comply with some standard outside or apart from himself. He is good. The very definition of it. It's why for us to understand, even with that conversation of, just be a good person. Well, then the question is, well, how do you compare to the standard of good? Because... He himself, he's lived to a standard. He is perfectly good. He doesn't compromise or falter. He never seeks evil evil for his people. He never seeks to bring death and destruction. He is someone who, as he created his world and set it into order, will act for the good of that created world. He will not drop the ball or abandon his promises, or fail his people. 
He is good. But a God who is just good is not our God. Because he's not just all good. He's also all powerful. See, if you had an all good God, but he wasn't all powerful, then you couldn't actually promise or rely on him to consistently get what he desires to happen. There's something outside of his power, something that can resist him, something that can oppose him. But our God is all powerful. There is not a single atom in this universe that can resist our God and go against him and his ways. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Look, I am the Lord, the God over every creature. Is anything too difficult for me? The reply is no. It's a rhetorical question. He's not wanting you to answer. The question is meant to convey the answer. There is nothing too powerful for me to do. Psalm 135.6 says, The Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and earth, in the seas and all the depths. There is no geographical limit to our God's power. He does not respect the claim that deities in Egypt have on the sun or the river. He does whatever he wishes. He sits in heaven and he laughs and does whatever he pleases. And no one can resist him. Which would be terrifying if he was not all good. That he would never use his power out of evil intent. But only uses it for the sake of bringing about that good purpose he has created this world with as the creator of it. But even a God who is all good and all powerful is also still limited if he is not also all knowledgeable. Meaning there is not a single thing in this world that he does not know. Job 37 verse 16 says, God speaking to Job at the end of the book says, Do you understand how the clouds float? those wonderful works of him who has perfect knowledge. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago from what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. He's not just all powerful and all good. He's all knowing. He knows the past to the future. He knows what's in your and mine heart and minds right now. He knows all things. Even with David, there was a time when David was fleeing from Saul, and David asked, if I go to this city, will they betray me? And God said, if you go and stay there, they will. Well, David didn't stay there. It wasn't the actual future that was going to take place. It was an entirely hypothetical situation. God still knows the answer. God knows what would happen if you made a slightly different change of choice this morning from what actually happened. He knows all the potential outcomes that could ever happen in this universe, in all things. He understands them all, not from someone who has a powerless type of just observe it and sit back. He knows it. He set it into motion like a a master. Have you ever seen those videos of people who set up like millions of dominoes? And they tip one over. And after like three minutes of watching them constantly fall down, you step back and there's this masterful picture that's been painted. Our God has done that with every single factor and variable in our universe from before it existed until it is finally completed. He knows it all. Nothing has escaped him. He knows every thought we have, every intention in our heart, even the things about ourselves that we don't fully understand. He knows them. And he is all powerful, meaning that he will accomplish his will for this world. And he is all good, meaning we can trust that it is good. Even when we go through things like suffering or trials, or even when we are just in this world and we 
like Job, call out and say, how could you do this to me when I didn't deserve it? And God can look down and say, do you understand how the clouds float? Those wonderful works of him who has perfect knowledge. See, the, there's a lot of times that we can demand answers of God. And I don't think that God wants us to be these people who kind of are stoic and act like we're not affected by the things that we go through in life. We do have times of sadness and despair. We have times of joy and jubilee. We have times where we are just crushed with grief and where we cry out to God and say, why? And God in those moments may not meet us and tell us the answer for why it is happening. But what we can rest assured is that because he is all good, and because he knows all things, that even if he doesn't share with us the why, we can trust that his plan is good. We can rest in him. God is all present. He's everywhere. David said in verse, or Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8, Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there, and if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And those two examples, Sheol is a way of referring to the grave. If I go down to the grave, into the ground, you're there. If I go up to heavens, heavens, they just refer to really sky. It wasn't a developed idea of heaven. It was talking about literally the skies above us. If I go all the way up into the heavens, you're there. Down in Sheol, you're there. We could say something like, if I go down into the grave, into the core of the earth, you're there. And if I go to the most distant galaxies that I could possibly see in this universe, you're there. I can't escape you, God. No matter where I go, you're there. I had a um, guy that I was doing discipleship with one time that he showed up, and we started having a conversation, and he said, tell me what you think about this, and pulled out a little um, like dog tag that had uh, St. Michael on it, an angel. And he was praying. He, it's a Catholic thing, and he had it, and he said, what do you think about this? Like, you pray to Michael for protection. And I was like, well, one thing is St. Michael is not the angel. No, I believe he's real, is not all present. So if you have it and you're praying to Michael and there's someone over here praying to Michael, this angel's not like God. He can't hear all things, can't answer all requests. Our God is able to hear your request as we're sitting here and your heart is troubled and you're praying about something in your life right now. Even there, he's there. And if you go to the ends of the earth, where there's no cellular reception and you can't check your Facebook and you're just at your wit's end, he is there. God is all present, which means that no matter where you go, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God of our universe is with you. He doesn't ever leave you or forsake you. And his intention is nothing but good for you. Which is why you can say in Romans 8 that he works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. His purpose that he designed because he's creator. We can trust that he's working it all for our goods because he's powerful enough to control it. He's knowledgeable enough not to have any uh, miscalculations in his plan. He's present enough, meaning that he never will leave us or forsake us. And he is good enough, knowing that we can always trust him, that he acts out of our benefit, even in difficulties. And as such, in all these things, we may have the problem of, well, how could this kind of God allow evil to go on in this world? And there's a whole lot of ethical questions around that. But what I will say is this, the fact that we can look around and say there is evil is a recognition that there is a good that it's compared to. We look around and see evil, which is our using this creation in a way contrary to the good that God intends for it. And though he could, the moment a person breathes the most evil 
little vapor out of their mouth, wipe them off of the face of the earth. Instead, he is compassionate to all of his creation and relents from bringing judgment so that they may believe and be benefactors of the good plan he designed. And so, an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, all-present God, as such, God will judge humanity rightly. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, examine the mind, I test the heart, to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. Psalm 98, verse 8 says, Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains shout together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. This is significant. Remember this about judging the earth. It'll be important in the coming weeks. He will judge the world righteously and the peoples fairly. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So in all of this, because he knows all things, because he is all powerful, because he is all knowledgeable, one thing we can rest assured is no wicked will go unpunished. When we're watching atrocities happen in the world, we can know that God is not sitting idly by without a care in the world on him. He grieves and mourns, and he will make it right, whether by the blood of his son or by the judgment coming on those who are rightly deserving of it. None escape his wrath except by the grace that he provides through pouring out his wrath on his only son. God is eternal, meaning that he's not someone who had a beginning or an end. Like, there was a point where I did not exist. There is never a point where God did not exist. God is, as Psalm 92, 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. God is not physical, not someone that we can go up and touch and see and hold his hand. God is, as 1 Kings 8, 27 says, but God indeed will live on the earth. Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less this temple I have built. It's what Solomon says after he's just built the temple and recognizes there's no place that can contain you. You're not physical. We can't put you in a box, God. There's no house that I could build that would even be able to hold you. You're all places in all times. But what about like when it says like, and the hand of God was against so-and-so, or the earth is the Lord's footstools, or uh, things like that, where it uses language of a body to talk about God. Well, in those moments, it's using it as a metaphor to help us kind of understand what God is doing. When it talks about like his hand being against someone, it's talking about God is finally bringing judgment against that person for what they're doing. Just as kind of like how we, if we're bringing judgment, you actually reach out and take hold of that person. You drag them to the, uh, to the courtroom. You put a hand against them. Or the, the earth is his footstool. You can't go to a geographical region on this earth and find the feet of God descending out of heaven, resting on the earth. But what it is saying is it's under his rule. He reigns over it. It's a place that is just decorating the temple that is his throne room. That he rests his feet upon as people come and worship him. Our God is unique. Exodus 15, verse 11. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Remember, all the gods that the Exodus, uh, or as the people were exiting Egypt, they left behind. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? And he's not like us, his creatures. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act, or promise and not fulfill? The answer is no. As an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful, 
all-present God, He, when He makes a promise, it is guaranteed it will happen because of who He is. There's no external factor to God that can inhibit Him from bringing about those things He promises. They always occur. Isaiah verse, or chapter 59, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking. And your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 22. This is why you are great, Lord God. There is no one like you, and there is no God besides you. All, as all we have heard, confirms this. There is no God like our God. And as we stand and try to think through this and go throughout our lives trying to ponder who He is, to have someone who is so other than us could leave us in some ways just kind of floundering, not knowing how we could truly know Him. But our God is also a God who reveals who He is to us. Psalm 116, verse 11 says, You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Jeremiah 9, verse 24 says, But to the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me. God wouldn't say that this should be our boast or that even we could understand him if there was no possibility of us being able to. Instead, he says, I've made myself known, and those who boast should boast that they know me. That I am the Lord, showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things. This is the Lord's declaration. Another evidence that God reveals himself is simply all the scripture that we have read came from him. He has given us His Word to show us who He is so that we may know Him. And God finally does not change. We know people in life, and you know, we say sometimes people do not change. And usually what, that mean is, what we mean by that is whoever they've shown themselves to be is who they're going to be in the future. But the reality is we all know that's not true. We are very different people from who we were 10 years ago, or we should be. As we grow and as we mature and learn, God shapes us and changes us, life shapes us and changes us, and we become different people. God does not. What we learn about Him as true is true from all of eternity past to all of eternity future. There is no worry or concern that at some point humanity is going to do so many horrendous things that God finally breaks and says, I now am no longer going to be good to them, but evil. He is who he is. Malachi 3, 6 says, Because I, the Lord, have not changed, your descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Because he is not changed, people may put their hope in him. He doesn't make a covenant and abandon his people. He doesn't agree or make promises to you and then not withhold them. He remains the same from the moment that you get to know something true about him for all of eternity. He never changes. And so, this is the God, kind of ignore Father, Son, and Spirit. God in the Old Testament is all of these things. As He revealed Himself and showed Himself to His people, He made it known to them, I am God, singular, no other. None can challenge me. None hold any authority compared to me. I am God. And this is who I am. I am a God who is one. 
I am a God who is the creator of the world. I am a God who is the source of life. I am a God who is all good, all powerful, all knowledgeable, all present. I'm a God who will judge the wicked. I am a God who is eternal, who is not physical, who is unique. There's no one like me. I'm a God who reveals myself to my people. I'm a God who does not change. Do not worship any other God because they do not deserve your worship. Outright. And then this man, Jesus, says, I am God. The man, the physical embodiment, the man who would hang on a cross and die, the man, Jesus, starts to make claims that I hope you see start to make a lot more sense. Because when I look at Jesus, if I had any man standing in front of me right now, would I say that they are the one God or the creator of the world? or the source of life, or that a man is all good, or all powerful. I mean, he's sitting by a well, weary, doesn't seem to be all powerful, all knowledgeable. Well, maybe if he knew that this uh, man who he healed by the pool of Bethesda was going to go tell the Jewish leaders about him, he might not have healed him and led to this where he's now trying to be killed that he's all present. Well, that's very clearly not true because I see him right there and he's not over there. That he will judge all humanity rightly. This man from Nazareth, this man who we actually have the authority to put him on trial and have him judged, that he's eternal. We know his mother. We remember when he was born. We went to the baby shower. Like he's not eternal. That God is not physical. He is clearly physical. That God is unique. This man is just like every other man that we see around us. He has flesh and bone. He needs to eat. He gets tired. He takes naps. Like, that he reveals to us who he is? Well, maybe. He definitely changes. I remember when he was a boy, and now he's a man. So he's changing. So if that's the evidence that you're stacking up, all of this, we see who the Old Testament reveals God to be, and then we have this man standing in front of us now who's making the claim that he is God. Why would you not stone him? How do you possibly go from that situation that they were in to now we have millions and millions and millions of people who worship him as God. Something clearly and overwhelmingly happened to testify to this man's claims. And there needs to be careful ways that we think through this and talk about Jesus as a man and Jesus as God that is rightly true about who he's revealing to be. So, As we get ready to delve into this, the tension that Jesus is about to create for the Pharisees, I hope that we're a little bit more appreciative of just how maybe fearful they were of the claims that he was starting to make. And just how significant those claims were. They weren't minor. They were worthy of being put to death if they were not true. And so, I'm going to finish by reading the passage that we read last week. Jesus responded to them and said, My father is still working, and I am also working. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, 
so that you will be amazed. And as we continue the story of Jesus, we are going to see exactly what those works are that so amazed a people who were afraid of compromising their one God religion, that so amazed them that there are moments that they fall down and worship this man, Jesus, that so amazed them that they were totally convinced that what this man was doing testified to the fact that he truly was the Son of God, that so amazed them that almost all of them were willing to let their lives be martyred for the sake of going and proclaiming who this man is. This man is Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This man is Jesus who, as God, hates and judges evil And as a man was willing to endure that judgment so that you and I won't have to. This man is Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. And his gospel places a call on all who hear. Will you surrender your life to this man? Father God, I pray that you would help us to recognize who Christ is, to recognize the claims that he made and just how startling they were. But Father, also to see the truth in them, that they would bear witness not just in uh, what we say, but Father, would bear witness in our lives. And Father, if there's anyone here today who's not truly decided to follow Christ, I pray that you would call them. Call them to yourself, Father. Save them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.